do, I'd like to introduce our one and only Elizabeth Stewart. Thank you, Thank you. Dan. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here with all these wonderful women, so many people working for not-for-profits in here. That's fantastic. Um, I want to start the afternoon by asking um, a question, giving this question a little background. Um, when we had the Hesacita fire, I was living up on La Vista, mm -hmm. and I lost a lot of things in the fire. But as the call for evacuation came through, I was in disbelief, and I had not prepared. Mm -hmm. So they said, look, you have one hour to get out. And I found myself taking the biggest suitcase I could and just grabbing, I don't know, stuff around my house that I didn't even realize that I liked or felt any connection to. So in that suitcase, um, I, and when I got to, the, to where I was, you know, to the Earl Warren, I couldn't even remember what I put in the suitcase. And I was surprised to find out that in the suitcase I put um, a number of CDs of favorite music. Like, I couldn't find those again, but <laughs> my son's baby teeth, my son's umbilical cord, a little figurine that was broken from my grandmother, um, another figurine that my other grandmother brought back when she did a cross-country trip in a um, Ford in 1918, I think it was. So my question is, let's say that you all are getting that same call. Tell me what piece you would grab. I think this is fascinating. What I, it, it, introducing this way is because uh, I just finished a dissertation, and what I did was a, I did a typology of collectors. And I investigated four types of collectors, the collector, the connoisseur, the fetishizer, and the hoarder. And I investigated people, how they reacted, what kind of stories they told around their things, and why. And so this is fascinating to me. But I think the main point is that we do have a relationship. Oh, and, and this is another little part of this, is that when I approached my committee to say, I want to write about a typology of collectors, and I want to write about stuff and things, my committee said, you know, three eminent professors one from the Sorbonne, one from the University of Montreal, one from here. My professor said, why should we care? And I said, well, people have a relationship to things that maybe you, you in the academia don't know about. And let me, you know, let me write about that for you. Well, I won them over. And in the end, I'm, I'm glad I did because I really got to explore what things mean to people. Now, even even Susie says she doesn't have a relationship the, that way. She's one type of person. But there are other types of people that can say I would divide the world between stuff people and non-stuff people. And I've been really interested to know that stuff people tend to marry non-stuff people. And they, <laughs> and they tend to get bugged by the non-stuff person you know, for 30, 40 years. Why do we have this much stuff, right? <laughs> So that it, it's generally that's how it works. But the stuff people have a relationship to stuff that is usually personal. So it usually involves like Denise, she's going through her mom's things, you know. Usually involves a relationship somewhere at the core. And um, which is really kind of shocking because what my career has been about is telling people what things are worth or telling museums what things are worth or telling insurance companies what things are worth. I had to kind of turn that paradigm around and say, you know, things are worth, honestly, the greatest canvas in the world is paint and canvas. So the greatest book in the world is print, is ink, paper, and just the glue and the binding, mm -hmm. see? So, so at the base of it, what are these things? And so this is why I'm interested to know the personal stories behind things, because that's what makes things valuable, I think. I'm going to look at a couple of things, and while we do, I'm going to describe 
I think we'll start with silver because we've got some silver here and I can describe by using these, these pieces of silver, I can describe the differences in silver. First of all, you should know sterling is a, is a fraction. And the fraction was done in the 15th century as the assay movement. It was a guild in London and they decided what we're going to do is we're going to say that things that are called sterling are going to be 925 parts silver over a thousand which can be other base metals, can be nickel, can be this, could be that. But the bottom fraction is a thousand parts. The top is the, is the quantity of pure silver. That's equals sterling. But I bet you didn't know there's other forms of silver. So for example, this is, this is not sterling. This is what we call 800 over a thousand. And this is continental silver. So it doesn't have the same uh, silver content, and it is not sterling, but it is silver. And so continental, I can read the hallmarks here. So this is from either Holland or Belgium, and it is silver reposé, and it, a, a little, a little um, jar to hold things on a lady's dressing table. Now, this would have been part of a set. So... Uh, a lady's dressing table, the largest I've ever seen was Josephine's dressing table. Mm -hmm. And Napoleon gave to her a dressing set, which was, I would say about three, three, four hundred pieces. And you had your, yeah, you had your hair receiver, you had your powder, uh, a powder jar, you had a little dish for your pins, you had a little um, a stand for the hooks that you used to, to get your boots tight. So you had this large set. And um, I like to tell this story, especially when it's ladies in the room, that the dresser set was a very intimate gift from a gentleman. Oh. And we think of that as, you know, why was that an intimate gift from a gentleman? Well, think about it. The dresser set was at the vanity table. The vanity table was used while you were de -shob. You're not completely dressed, right? So you're not completely ready for your world. And you've just risen fresh from your bed. You see, now you get the idea why a dresser set was an intimate gift. And the more um, you were hoping to be close to that lady's bed, the larger the dresser set <laughs> tended to be, which is why little Napoleon gave this 300 and 400 piece dresser set. So the dresser set was an important movement towards um, a proposal, whether it be of marriage or whatever, uh, that was a dresser set. So that would have been a part of a dresser set, that little box, and it would have been comprised of what we see here, which is also really interesting because this is in the same style. Now this isn't polished, but this is also a Dutch silver. It is 800 over 1,000. If it was polished, you'd see it was indeed silver. And that's quite nice. It's got a nice little beveled mirror. Um, I think Anne asked as we were coming in, and she made a joke. She said, you know, what did women do before there were mirrors? And when were mirrors invented? I can tell you. So mirrors were actually very ancient. It goes back about 8,000 years. And mirrors actually were a polished piece of brass or bronze. You polish the one side. The other side would be like this, some kind of decoration. But you would be able to see your reflection in the bronze of the other side of the mirror. So mirrors go back a long time. Anne said that one of her kids brought, bought her one of those mirrors that make your face like five times bigger. And she, she just dropped it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just dropped it. So mirrors, mirrors were actually very, very old invention. We weren't the glass mirror was invented for Versailles. So at Versailles, now why were mirrors important for an interior setting? Was that the mirrors reflected the light sconces, right? The candle sconces would reflect that back into the room. So the original inception of a, of a silver coated piece of glass was used to reflect back light, not to see yourself in. Oh. So you had your mirror, which was your metal mirror, but on the wall, if you were wealthy enough, you used a mirror to reflect back the light, because light was precious, yeah? So the, the value of this, without its set, I would say is about $200 for this lovely little thing. And the, this set here, 
is a natural boar bristle with the actual wood backing in this set I would put at 200 to $300. Now you would notice it's not as expensive as sterling. Sterling is considered a little higher quality than, than 800 silver. Um, this is another piece of silver. Now this is a sterling box and it's a box, a cigarette box for example. It says St. Elmo, probably a school, 1917. Uh, KSS, lovely little sterling box. And the hallmark actually, uh, the hallmark is American. So it, one time I'll come back and talk to you about how to tell American silver versus English silver. But suffice to say, the silver from American firms, are you, the silver is usually marketed through jewelry companies as opposed to the assay system in Britain. So the jewelry companies, this particular box, very small type, um, it says, Star Frost, so it's um, a shop, Star Frost would be the jeweler that manufactured it. The best sterling that we produced has the shop mark of Tiffany, or Cartier. And so that's an important thing to watch for. That box, I would say $400 is about the value of that. And then these two lovely teapots. And this is a fantastic shape on its own little stand. Now, we look at this and we say that's a very interesting shape. But what I want you to do is think about this. There's, in the history of art, there's a pendulum that swings. So the pendulum goes between geometric and organic, and it swings consistently this way. And we have wonderful, two wonderful examples of geometric organic, see? So when you say, well, the geometric styles, and it's not just silver that I'm gonna to refer to here. I'm also referring to architecture and jewelry and anything in any era that has a line. You can look at almost anything and tell me what year it's from by just the line. And I'll give you an illustration of that. I did a decorative arts course for City College. And I had a Japanese student who spoke maybe three words of English. And we were studying the decorative arts. Obviously, I was lecturing in English. And it was going right over his head. He wasn't getting it, although I could see he was a talented artist. He was sketching, drawing as we were talking. So I was talking about an era, 1969, and I was using rock posters, right? So the Haight-Ashbury uh, rock posters, the Grateful Dead, et cetera. I was using that to explore that concept I just told you of the organic line coming back in. So if you think of a poster like that, think of that organic line. So this young man, he didn't understand what was going on at all. So that day I would driven my son's car that I gave him I had throughout high school, which was a 1969 Super Sport Camaro, okay? So if you remember the line of a Super Sport Camaro, it's like a, almost like a shark. Starts off in the back like this, has that little lip, goes down like this, then here's the top, goes down, and then the, the top part goes very sleek like this. So watch my hand, and you can tell me, ah, Elizabeth, that is 1969 in a line. Think of platform shoes, think of the rock posters, think of the organic line of the late 60s, right? So here's the back, here's the trunk, there's the top, there's the hood. Duh. See, that's the line of the 1960s, late 1960s. Oh, that's my phone. <laughs> so, Every era has a line, and this is an interesting example. This is the um, straightforward geometric line versus the beautiful organic line. And when we say, well, what, where did that geometric line come from? It came from classical architecture. It came from Greek and Roman architecture. So if you look at this and you think of um, a, an ancient Roman sarcophagus, if you think of a, uh, the structure, for example, the Parthenon, if you think of that, you see that's where that classical line comes from. Even so far as if you say, 
a klismos chair, which is the chair that the Greeks inherited from the Egyptians, that very straight X chair with that straight back. It's completely the classical line. So it goes, it goes from organic back to geometric, organic back to geometric. Right now we're in a geometric phase where everybody's rediscovering mid-century. See? So we're, in, we're back to that ge geometry. A little earlier in our um, history, remember Shabby Chic? Oh, yes. You see, that was organic. So we, it goes back and forth between the two, and this is a great illustration. Both of these are silver plate, but one is different in that the base metal on this is not nickel. The base metal is copper. When the base metal is copper, we call it Sheffield plate. It's from a certain area in, in Great Britain, Sheffield, and Sheffield plate can be as valuable as silver. Why? Because when the plate actually is, is laid over copper, and it can be in an electromagnetic process that it's laid, or it can be a pounded process where the sheets of silver are individually pounded on each item. The copper shows through and it gives a real warmth to the piece. So both of these are leads. They have the hallmark for leads, both of these. Now, a question for all of you. Now, you'll notice that the handle and the top are ivory. Why do you think that is? You see, yeah, you see, when you pour really boiling hot water in a teapot, silver is the most conductive or one of the most conductive of all metals. And so the handle needs to be something else. As a matter of fact, people always say to me, I have a silver service, uh, it's sterling, but I also have a silver plate service, and I always get the two mixed up. How do I tell which is which? Well, next time you're over at your girlfriend's house, you're having lunch, and she doesn't bring out her silver for you. Here's a way to tell. You take, let's see, who's got it? May I use your spoon, Lori? Oh, sure. Yeah. So you take the sterling spoon and you hold it up to your cheek. You take the silver plate spoon, you hold it up to your cheek. The sterling spoon will conduct heat faster and you'll feel, oh, it's, it's getting hot faster. The silver plate one will retain its coolness. So you can say to your girlfriend, why aren't you getting your sterling out for me? <laughs> you see? So that's how you tell silver plate versus sterling. And you'll see me constantly at, an, at a house. I'll be putting things up to my face to see, is it sterling? After a while, you get the hang of it. This is silver plate. Now, I like to say that there was an era uh, we started around 1870, right after we recovered from the Civil War, and also coinciding with mechanism happening in the Industrial Revolution, the later Industrial Revolution in England. What you get is you get stuff that has no reason for existing. Only by the fact it, it could exist, by the fact that the market could make it, and by the fact that it created status amongst families, it existed. Such a thing is this. Do you really need this? Right? Do you really need a toast rack? And sometimes these come included. I mean, Susie's going to rush out and buy five million of these, I know. She's a non. It's actually mine. There's some kind of mark. I got it as a wedding gift. Yeah, and you've used it so much I can tell. So it has no reason for being, this is silver plate, it's British. And there's some kind of mark on the bottom? Yes. It. Yeah. So the mark would be how, where it's retailed from. And it's, there's also a little silver plate mark as well. But these sometimes come with little egg cups and sometimes little stands for the egg cups. I mean, it just gets ad, ad nauseum because basic. But what this is indicative of, it's a cultural indication of the people, the things that you set on a late Victorian table, okay, let me tell you what you set on a late Victorian table. You would have uh, from your canteen, your canteen was your silver service. So you'd have a silver service, at least, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five forks, right? One, two, three spoons, two knives. Then if you were serving the different courses, if you had a fish service, you'd have two more. You'd have another fork and another knife. If you were serving a cheese service, another. If you were serving a fowl service, another. So you see it would grow out like this. 
honestly, you really only need one utensil, really, right? You, but, you know, this was conspicuous status making, right? So you'd have all of your utensils spread out amongst you. Do you really need water, wine, uh, red and white, port, um, sherry, coffee, tea? Do you, all of those would be at the service. You didn't need those. But what happened was the people uh, at Newport, Rhode Island, had them. So darn it, we were going to have it too. And therefore, you have this profilation of silver plate coming onto the market in 1870 or so. So silver plate is, is becoming um, the thing. It is now the curse. Right? How many people have inherited their mother's wedding presents and it's silver plate out the kazoo? It's like, what do we do with this stuff? Nobody knows. Oh, and by the way, my son was married a couple years ago and I had saved his great grandmother's spode, China service, 18th century uh, sterling flatware, my uh, Steuben uh, crystal for him. And I was all excited, my new daughter-in-law, here you are, you know this. <laughs> we don't want it, mom. They don't want it. What's happened is the market has crashed mm -hmm. because none of that generation, my son's 26, none of that generation wants any of our formal service. So, now think of this, I have a spode set uh, everybody knows the Christmas tree pattern, right? So it's my china that I get out at Christmas, right? This I thought he, for sure he'd want. I'd say, okay, so you don't want the formal stuff. How about the Christmas china? He says, what? <laughs> You're going to have different china for Christmas dinner? No, we don't want that. No, we don't want that. So you can't do anything with this stuff. You can't sell it. It's really flat. It really is. So, but you know, it may come back, things swing like that, it may be rediscovered. We may have formal services again. You know, we may get rid of microwaves and dishwashers too. I don't think so. But that's pretty much what's changed. You see, that's a whole thing. But what I'm saying is right after the Civil War, we have this almost exactly opposite of what we're doing today. We have this conspicuous table uh, settings, exactly opposite of our more pared down today. So. This is an example of that. It's a little le a l lesson for Susie in cultural history of conspicuous consumption, of which she does not partake. <laughs> okay, now we have two beautiful boxes that are very, very different. Now, uh, the lady who brought them said, well, one has something in it, one doesn't. And there's a reason for that. Was this it cigar? At no tea. Oh, tea, of course. So, and the indication of that is that this paper is a little bit uh, metal plated, right? So there's a little bit shiny metal plate to the, that's because the tea needs to stay hum humidorified, yeah. right? So here's the t little tea box, has also, remember, we were talking about the classical, this is the classical line, here again, very classical line, almost like a little uh, Roman temple, and a very classical seashell. When we think of the seashell, we think of who? We think of Venus, right? We think of Venus and all of the niceties associated with Venus. And she's the seashell. This is a very classical piece. This is British. It's late 18th century. It's about a $400 piece. This is phenomenal. This is a really beautiful piece. We were talking about the dresser set. Now, this would be part of a dresser set in so far as these are little perfumes. And the, so this was made, this is a little sterling top, inlaid box. This is probably French. And this is also 18th century. And what's so interesting is when you think about a, a little box like this, you think, well, you had to have a carpenter. You had to have a woodworker and an inlay person. But you also had to have a special person to blow these because this is pre-mold glass. Free, you know, we have molded glass now. It's pressed in a mold. This is pre that. This is blown into a mold. So it's not poured. The glass isn't poured into a mold. It's blown into a mold. How do you tell that is if you look inside, you can see where it's convex outside. It's concave inside because you're blowing it. You're blowing that glass like a balloon into a mold.
right? So this is a little mold blown, and so that is an indicative of the first quarter of the 19th century. So the fact that it's mold blown, first quarter of the 19th century. And then again, each little stopper has to be done separately too. So, and then the liner has to do the lining job. So such a thing is probably worth about $800. Uh, this is a pretty fascinating thing. So what this is, and it, it goes onto one of your fingers, or it goes onto your chatelaine, and this is something that uh, women had a lot of these at one point in time because women were constantly fainting. I don't know. We don't faint today. What's wrong with us? We should faint more often, you know. But anyway, this, this held your, your smelling salts, right? So it has this little lid and this comes off, you put your smelling salts in there, and it, you always had it with you, you see, because you know you were gonna faint at any moment. <laughs> so you always had it with you. You know, you're, you're about to faint, so there you had it. Now, you know, at the same time you were having 14 kids, you were fainting every minute, right? So, you know, this also went on the chatelaine. The chatelaine was the, the sort of metal belt that you wore, and on the chatelaine you would have, at certain times of day, different things. If you were doing your household chores, you would have maybe a little grocery list that you'd have to give your, your um, grocer, your caretaker, whatever, who's looking after your kitchen. You'd also have a little pencil. You'd have a little tiny bag with a little space for one coin. Maybe some eyeglasses and maybe a watch on your chatelaine and your house keys. Now, today, I always like to say, you know, every one of my lectures I get to to just make such a contrast because that was, you wore that. And if you were going out and you were going to a ball, you would have a little pad with a little silver um, top and bottom, and that pad would be the, your dance partners through the evening. You would write that down. Now, when I go out the house, now I, I, I changed bags this morning because I thought, well, I'm wearing a suit and don't have to bring my work bag, but my work bag is bigger, right? So can you imagine this would, this is, this is my day, but, you know, things have changed. That, we carry so much more. So that was what you carried on your shed lane. You just had your little, your little, you know, whatever you needed with one coin. This was part of a chatelaine. Now, this is Scottish. It's horn, and it has the Scottish hallmark. It has a little uh, thistle design, which is beautiful, all the thistle around here, and a little... Uh, um, stone also associated with Scotland, but this is your smelling salts, enough to go on your pinky in case you were about to faint. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> now, I don't know what you did when you fainted. Who picked you up? <laughs> Maybe you only fainted around handsome men. That, that must be it. Okay, so now, uh, also, French porcelain, this is a Limoges porcelain, and it's in the go style, again, very organic, very, you know, it's going into that direction again. Now, it, whoever brought this, is there a set? There may have been. May have been, okay. So, um, this is just a little uh, side plate, and the Limoges, Limoges is a place, and Limoges, there must have been at one point 150 to 200 factories making porcelain in the Limoges area, it, bega it began to be a lesser quality when Mr. Haviland moved in. So the Haviland Limoges is not as good as the Limoges Limoges, but I will tell you that in my son's age group, if you're going to give them any porcelain, this would be the least desirable. <laughs> yeah. Why? The gold. They can't put it in the dishwasher. Oh, that's true. The gold. You can't, you've got, and you've got to wash it by hand, mm -hmm. you see? So this, the, the, you, so this is, so this is, I, I hate to say it, but these are not, that, that only because of the way we live today, you see? What's that worth? About $25, even as old as it is, which is 1880. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah. So let me move to this. This is a little Hiroshigi. Hiroshigi is a fascinating artist uh, because there were 18 of him. 18 of him? Excuse me? Okay, how I explain this. So this is one of Hiroshigi's woodcuts, and um, this is the two couple, the couples crossing over on a rainy day on a bridge, just beautiful. 
1850, and think of what we were doing as far as paintings in 1850. This is almost abstract in, in comparison. Now, the difference between uh, Western art and Occidental art is that the idea, or excuse me, Western, uh, Occidental and Oriental art is that Oriental art is meant to be classic. That means that Hiroshigi won, had an apprentice that wasn't necessarily of his family, but it would be somebody that he thought was talented. He trained that apprentice in the way he did his woodcuts. The more accurate that apprentice could copy the work of the, of the, of the senior, he was allowed to be a Hiroshigi. He's allowed to take the, the name of his mentor. Like all of the Hiroshigis that followed, they were not necessarily related but they could do the style in the style of the master. So that meant you had, uh, from the late 1600s to the, 19, the, to the late 1900s, so 300 years of this progression, where you can't really tell unless you understand paper content, unless you understand the, the, the really interesting small variations the idea is not to be an innovator. The idea is to remain in that classic style and have time move as slow as possible. So I like to always say, you know, uh, this is another example because this, this actually is Imari. Right? So this is Japanese Imari. And so what is interesting about this is that this Imari could be 1400, could be 1500, could be 1600, could be 1700. I know that this is 1800 or maybe 1700 because of the porcelain, but the shape and the decor does not change. It does not change. This is Imari and it's Imari and it's Imari no matter whatever generation it is. But the Hiroshigi is worth three to four hundred dollars and Look very closely, Denise, because usually Hiroshigi made things in triptych. Oh, okay. So what it is is a narrative. Uh -huh. One, two, three, and this is telling a story, the narrative. So pay attention that maybe in your mom's stuff there could be two others that would go on either side uh -huh. to tell the story of the lovers crossing the bridge. So okay. here we're talking about, yeah, go through the back. Here we go, more work, right? Yeah. So. Uh, Imari, what do we get when we get lamps like this? A fascinating thing because the first building to be electrified, of course, was uh, the Hotel del Coronado. And Thomas Alva Edison electrified that in the 1870s. And so when he invented the light bulb and made the Coronado come alive, what everybody did was say, let's take the most valuable pieces of porcelain urns or vases, let's drill a hole through them, and let's make it a central focus of the room so we can show that we have our own lights. Oh, I bought this like 40 years ago, and it was, it was not a lamp. And a good friend decided to turn it into a lamp for me and drilled it. So the reason I bought it is I'd like to know, you know the difference if she had if she had it. Yeah. <laughs> this is so common that actually it's not as bad as you think because almost everybody in the 1920s took the Ming vase that should be worth $60,000 today and drilled because they wanted the, everybody to see, I am electrified now and this is you know the best thing in the world and so you gave it the best place of honor. In other words, you drill the Ming vases. Sometimes you drill right through the center of a statue through the center of a, you know, a piece of a bronze sculpture. Uh, I've seen lamps being drilled through almost anything. So Imari and the, the vase itself, this is probably a $4,000 vase. Um, it, it is probably uh, late 18th century in the Imari style. Imari was traded back and forth between Japan and China. So I think that this is Japanese, but it could be Chinese, but they traded back and forth the Imari pattern. Um, this would have been, um, well, you can see the cartouche with the character, the geisha and the, the um, blossoms, the chrysanthemum for long life, etc. The fact that it's drilled makes it probably about half the value, but still it's a $2,000 piece. 
right? So many things were drilled. In fact, that is like a big, if, you, if anybody likes the thrift stores like I do, look in the lamp department. Because you'll find these things that were drilled that were really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so $2,000 on that. Um, this is probably the sweetest little thing in the world. It's a, a, little, a little powder box or snuff box. And we don't know if it was powder or snuff because both were used, right? Calling cards. Or calling cards, OK. Oh, yes. so it, it might be calling cards. This is a French enamel. So this is enamel. This is from France. Enamel, beautiful little scene. And then the hallmark of French enamel, you see the design, the kind of shine to it? This is all done what we call with, in the style called cloisonné. Mm -hmm. Same style. So the, it's a cloisonné. It's an enameling put over very fine pieces of silver coil. And it gives this wonderful kind of geometric shape to it. And it is sterling. Now these, these have great following. This is probably worth $800 to $1,000, just this little one. Because, yeah, these are, yeah. 800 to 1,000, Eleanor? They're, 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 people collect. You paid $10, you did good. People collect these. People collect these. Yeah, so this is a, a very good one. Um, this is awful sweet. This is actually what we call a cross collectible. There's Queen Victoria on here, and it shows her doing all sorts of things driving, motor car, fishing, cycling. Blah, blah, blah. And it, this is after one year after the Jubilee, and it is marketed by Harrods Stores, which is still around. And um, little piece when I say, well, what does Elizabeth mean when she says cross collectible? What I mean is, not only does it appeal to collectors who collect Jubilee material, but it appeals to collectors who collect porcelain from Harrods. It appeals to collectors who collect anything to do with Queen Victoria. It, so you see there's, the concept is this. If you're sitting at auction and you have an item that could be purchased for three separate categories, the auction bidding is more heated. So that's what's called a cross collectible. So that's what that is, Dean, is cross collectible. And that's worth about 250 to $300, that little piece. Um, we talked about this. Now, um, let's talk about Rebecca's horse. This is Raymond Nils as the artist. The horse is flying ebony, obviously a great race horse at one time. The piece is dated to 1920. Rebecca actually sent me a little image of it. Actually, she's got a, an amazing collection and an amazing house. She's one of my early clients. Mm -hmm. And I know when you said you saved your silver, I know why, Rebecca, because she's got some gorgeous silver. This is from Rebecca's collection. I picked it out of some of the pieces that she's had, she had in her house. I think it's fantastic because the sheen on that horse is unbelievable how the artist did that. There's something on an antique road show just recently, similar to this. Hmm. Now, I don't remember what it was valued at, but quite a bit more than this. Yeah. Thing. So, um, so I want to say two things, Eleanor. The piece on the Antiques Road Show was by George Stubbs, and he was the, I know because I work occasionally for the road show, and I do, wrote, I do research for them. And so um, the, the piece by George Stubbs, George Stubbs is an equine artist, and he specialized in racehorses and trotter horses, and he's in the last, first, first part of the 19th century, Stubbs. This is actually a little later, so it's 1920s. But what I think is so fascinating about this is usually when we think of racehorses, we don't necessarily think of a California landscape. We think of... This is after. Yeah. He retired. It's after he... So we usually think of a Kentucky scene. We think of a racetrack scene. But that is us right there. That's Central Coast, isn't it? So I think it's fascinating, and Rebecca, I think that's a very painterly piece. It's in the style of the California plain, art, plain air painters, and I think it's a beautiful piece. And I, I would say that the piece is worth between two and three thousand dollars. So yeah, it's a, a gorgeous work. I like it very, very much. And the right collector, let's say, cross collectible, 
somebody who collects plein air, who collects racehorse things, and who collects the work of this artist would pay you almost anything for it. You see, it depends who's in the audience at the auction. And then I always get asked this question, so I will tell you right now before I close, that um, Eleanor brought up the Antiques Roadshow. And people always say to me, well, in the Antiques Roadshow, it's so uh, amazing that you appraisers, you know, blah, 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 you're, you know, snap of the wrist, you know your thing. So what happens is, to tell the truth, people line up. Us appraisers get to say, I want to look at that, 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 and that. Then we get three days with our assistants and our databases and big hotel room with all of your fancy stuff. We can do as much research as we want. But the fun thing, Eleanor, is that the normal reaction when someone's told, like the George Stubbs, this is a $189,000 painting, right? <laughs> when someone's told that, like if I told you that, Rebecca, that is worth half a million dollars. Well, you wouldn't say it, but normally people would say, holy. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Well, the roadshow folks know that. And so before they call the people and say, look, come in, to, come in and be made up, that's a little bit of a clue, isn't it? So come in and be made up. There's what they call a happy coach. And the happy coach says, we're going to tell you something that will make you happy. Do not say the following. <laughs> Do not say that. Well, it's been fun being with you. Oh, it's been fun being. Yes, we're going to have some time for questions, but thank you for inviting me. I sure appreciate it. And like Anne said, if anyone's interested, I do have the CDs. And the CDs are just the same as the book, exactly the same. So if you like what's in the table of contents in the book, they're, they're $10. If you like the book, you buy the book too, but printing is high. Uh, first yes, of, yes. Yeah. I don't think you looked at space a little bit. Oh, I didn't. That's right. This, actually, I was saving this for last, and I'm sorry I missed it. This is a barber bottle. What's a barber bottle? A barber. Right. So in back of your toilette, if you were a gentleman and you were having your hair done. Now, this is early, so this is the last, last quarter of the, of the 18th century, first quarter of the 19th century. So that's a barber's bottle. So in back of your chair, remember, you're, you're having your hair fixed before you go out for the day. In back of your chair was a series of beautiful bottles, and it held, you know, hair pomade, it held aftershave, all these. And when people look at those, they think, how could that be for a, thank you, Lynn, so thank you, not at all. How could that be, how could that be a gentleman's bottle, because it's so feminine looking? Well, the fact is, it is. There, there's, these were placed in back of a, of a a hairdressing station and you had a, a line of these beautiful beautiful bottles wow. uh, this is all hand painted in a very nice glass and it is probably 1810 this is probably the oldest thing at, at the show today wow. yeah an old barber's bottle designed for a man actually to go in back of a man's chair in a whole line of them there'd be eight ten of these all lined up all the same hmm. yeah yeah not necessarily pomade, but it would be like aftershave and, and oil. oils and all the frou-frou stuff that men had. And of course, what you have to realize is we're, we're in the era 19, excuse me, 1810 when men still wore wigs. Oh, you know. Right? So that is probably worth $800 right there. Right there. Who brought that? Joanne? Was that Joanne? No. Judy. Judy. Oh. Joanne has a question. I have a question. I was the one who picked up that uh, brush set at a flea market in Antwerp for five bucks. All right. Um, would it be worth more? I thought it was pewter. Would it be worth more if I cleaned it up and had the silver showing, or is it the way it is? And I don't do polishing all that well, so it's probably best to leave it. I would leave it then. In that case, there's ways that if you don't know your polishes and you don't know your um, abrasives, uh, I had a, a Tiffany China, a, a Sterling tea service when I lived in San Diego, and I had 
I treated myself to a housekeeper because my son was doing something for him. And of course, my housekeeper um, scoured it with Brillo. Oh. So there's, you know, there's, there's things that you shouldn't do to Sterling. And so uh, Joanne, I would leave it alone because the problem is with a lot of the Sterling creams and preparations, there's so many holes in this. Oh, yeah, Forget about it. You know, it's just going to get all cruddy in there. So I would leave it, leave it as it is. There's ways, actually, though, that you can treat these with natural things. For example, instead of Goddard's or Wright's silver cream, you can use lemon, for example. So there's all these other things you might look into that won't hurt it at all. Would yeah. you use lemon for just any sort of silver? Or just for silver that becomes um, honey? You can use lemon, but see, I, I, it's the lemon and something else. But look online, Rebecca, and see, because there's natural ways, and I suggest that because you know that if you, if you took Goddard to this, it would be all white in all the holes. Yeah. So I don't think that's what we need to do on this. Plus, it's hard to polish this. How about a polishing cloth? Th that would work. Yeah. 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 And you said you uh, should take a Brillo to your silver. Mm -hmm. I had someone like that who did something to almost all that now, what is it? Does that just totally negate, negate its value? Or? No, uh, it can be. Silver can actually be silver plated as well. But um, what I did was I took a, a, a drill and a buffer wheel, a soft buffer wheel, and I buffed it. You can still see it, but not as badly. Yeah. Do I have any other questions? Well, it's been so much fun having you guys. <laughs>